Second platoon of Chosen Company arrived in Wanat on the evening of July 8th, with the rest of the force arriving by helicopter on July 9th. The force at Cop Kaler was sizable, consisting of three paratrooper rifle squads, each with a vehicle and crew serve weapon, a platoon of 24 Afghan National Army Infantry, and three Marine embedded training team members. For fire support, the platoon was augmented with the tube launch wire guided, optically tracked tow missile launcher system, a 60 millimeter mortar, and a 120 millimeter mortar. They were also augmented with a squad of engineers with a Bobcat loader to build fortifications and a long range advanced scout surveillance system, LRAS 3, to provide around the clock surveillance. Task Force Rock had also secured the use of several different ISR platforms for use during Rock Move, including full motion video as well as signals intelligence assets. Though powerful tools, these could not be counted on as the sole means of detecting enemy movement. Insurgents have become adept at using vegetation and moving in small numbers to avoid detection by ISR assets. Upon arrival, 2nd Platoon began to fortify their positions. They chose a large open field to the south of the town across the street from the bazaar and a building that served as a hotel and cafe. The cop was ringed with concertina wire and the bobcat was used to fill HESCO barriers and excavate positions for several squads in the mortar pit. First squad set up a traffic control point near the bazaar which served as the main gate for the cop. The Afghan National Army platoon established a second traffic control point 100 yards to the south, as well as fighting positions at the northern perimeter. Second platoon also established OP topside on the ridge to the east of Cop Kaler. The OP was a complex of three interconnected fighting positions built around a large outcropping of boulders. It was not ideal terrain, having significant dead space, which could be used by insurgents to maneuver unobserved from a nearby ravine and a civilian compound above it on the southeast ridge. Ultimately, those detractors were judged to be less severe than the risk of a more isolated observation post with better positioning. Topside was defended by the LRAS-3, two M240 machine gun teams, an M249 squad automatic weapon, and an M203 40 millimeter grenade launcher. The force of nine troopers was rounded out with several riflemen and the platoon's designated marksmen. It was ringed with a single row of barbed wire and walls of double sandbags. Each night, Claymore mines were placed in the dead space to the north and east as additional security. Logistics difficulties caused many problems for 2nd Platoon. The heavy equipment and contractors that were supposed to build the COP had to be rescheduled due to delays in executing rock move. This also caused a shortage of construction materials, so none of the positions had overhead cover. The Bobcat was only partially affected because the fuel blivet pump broke and it took a day to get spare parts. This combination of events caused the paratroopers of 2nd Platoon to manually excavate their positions. The dirt was excessively hard and the weather hot, so they quickly ran through their two-day supply of water. The lack of a planned resupply on the 9th forced them to ration their work and conserve water until a sizable water resupply came on July 11th. Rock Move enjoyed a significant amount of ISR coverage, especially in the early days of the move. The UAVs were directed to look in known insurgent safe havens and for movement on the hillside surrounding Wanat. No sizable insurgent presence was observed massing in the valley, so those assets were pulled to other areas. Throughout the initial days of construction, 2nd Platoon was constantly observed by insurgents. Several military-aged males were seen sitting in the bazaar watching intently. Few women or children were observed in the area, and men were observed walking around slowly as though they were measuring the cop with pace counts. This scrutiny was reported to chosen leadership and identified as expected for the operation. Early in the afternoon of July 12th, another possible attack indicator emerged. The second platoon leader heard about a shura occurring in the town that he wasn't invited to. According to local custom, the platoon leader is equivalent to an elder and has the right to attend the shura. Upon arrival at the Shura, he and the Afghan National Army representatives were not received warmly, and there was speculation that the elders were in fact planning an attack. This was reported up the intelligence chain of command and gained significant attention by Task Force Rock's senior leadership. Shortly after the Shura, the chosen company commander arrived at the COP. Despite the outward resistance toward coalition forces, he was invited to dinner that night by a villager loyal to the Afghan government who warned of an impending attack. 
The company commander was told he should shoot at anyone seen moving through the hills. Over the course of the deployment, the commander had received repeated warnings from locals about attacks that never happened, and put this warning in that same category. The unit's greatest fear was a rocket attack or indirect fire attack before they could install overhead protection. Nothing they experienced led them to believe a large-scale attack was imminent. On the morning of July 13th, 2nd Platoon Chosen Company and their Afghan partners conducted Stand 2 at 0400, and the 2nd Platoon leader was organizing a patrol to find a more advantageous site for OP topside. As Stand 2 continued, the trooper manning the improved target acquisition system, ITAS, on the tow observed five personnel moving through the hills 1,500 meters west of the cop. It was unlikely that local citizens would travel together like that, so Chosen Company began to coordinate a tow and mortar attack. Twelve minutes after the insurgents were initially spotted, fire mission preparations were interrupted by two bursts from an insurgent machine gun and a large number of rocket-propelled grenades. The initial volley of machine gun fire served as a signal for the remainder of the insurgent force. Intense and continuous volleys of machine gun and RPG fire from all sides of the cop continued for the next hour. The insurgent fire was accurate and came from positions that were within several yards of the perimeter. The hotel, mosque, and bazaar were all being used as firing positions. Immediately after the enemy opened fire, Chosen Company Commander notified Task Force Rock Command Post and requested indirect fire and air support. In response, Task Force Rock also ordered 1st Platoon at Camp Blessing to leave as soon as possible to reinforce 2nd Platoon at Wanat. The constant rate of fire from positions in the village effectively isolated OP topside from the main perimeter. Reinforcing and maintaining contact with the observation posts became Chosen's top priority for the remainder of the fight. The opening volley was particularly devastating to the tow and the other crew served weapons at the cop. Three RPGs caught the tow vehicle in their crossfire, setting the vehicle on fire. This forced the crew to abandon the vehicle and move to the command post. The 120mm mortar section also drew tremendous fire during the opening portion of the attack. The mix of full and half-filled HESCO barriers provided some protection from insurgents who had climbed nearby trees and who were firing from the building roofs. The mortar section managed to execute the planned fire mission and then reverted back to defending the pit with grenades and small arms. Coalition forces made several attempts to reach the 60mm mortar position but were deterred by the heavy rate of fire. Its location in the middle of the cop and incomplete fighting position made it especially dangerous. It would not be fired for the duration of the engagement. A few minutes into the attack, an RPG round exploded near the ammunition supply point within the mortar pit. This caused the personnel in the mortar pit to evacuate to the command post position. Shortly after, the tow round started to cook off in the tow vehicle, scattering burning missiles throughout the cop. Chosen Company Commander was managing fire support assets and making reports to headquarters. Rock Move had priority of fires for Task Force Rock, who launched 155mm indirect fire, which landed only six minutes after the attack started. The mountainous terrain made accurate targeting with the 155mm difficult, causing them to impact inside the danger close radius of 660 meters from Cop Kaler. Responding to an early request for air support, a B-1 bomber dropped two bombs north of the battlefield to prevent insurgent reinforcement 38 minutes into the attack. The traffic control point manned by 1st Squad Chosen Company did not escape insurgent attention. They were taking intense fire from the compound to the southeast, disabling their M2 50 caliber machine gun only five minutes after the fight started. They returned fire with an AT-4 destroying the position, but fire from other positions continued. OP topside was devastated by the initial fire. Despite being badly wounded, the surviving paratroopers managed to return fire until they either ran out of ammunition or their weapons were damaged. After initially using one of two available M240 machine guns, they then continued firing with M4s, grenades, and claymore mines. It was not long before Chosen sent reinforcements to the remaining defenders at topside. Two soldiers, including the 2nd platoon leader, ran between the bazaar and hotel. 
They reached the observation post safely, but were almost immediately killed along with the topside defender while attempting to set up a defensive position. By this time, five of the original nine members of the OP garrison remained alive, but only two were able to engage several insurgents who had penetrated the perimeter wire and were only feet from the soldiers. One soldier was killed attempting to suppress enemy fire from the hotel. Running out of ammunition, one paratrooper found a light anti-tank weapon, which he fired before he and other survivors abandoned the OP and moved down to the first squad's traffic control point. Unbeknownst to the paratroopers, they had left a soldier at OP topside. He managed to scrounge up an M203 grenade launcher and began to lob rounds into the dead space north of the observation post. After expending all his rounds, he contacted the command post on his Ford Observer radio and informed them that the OP was going to fall if reinforcements weren't sent. First platoon departed Camp Blessing at 0515 and was making good time en route to Wanat. Expecting IEDs and ambushes, the platoon used its heavy weapon systems to fire into known insurgent positions along the way. A four-man element was dispatched to topside. They engaged insurgents as they moved to the observation post and quickly established fighting positions to counter a renewed insurgent attack. Shortly after, all four soldiers were wounded by a combination of RPG and machine gun fire. An inadvertent hot mic on the topside radio interrupted communications, causing the chosen leadership to lose situational awareness of the OP. This caused the platoon sergeant to quickly assemble and lead another relief element of eight men to the OP. As they reached topside approximately an hour into the fight, a pair of AH-64 Apaches arrived overhead to provide close combat aviation support. The Apache's first gun run was in the brush directly adjoining OP topside, and the second was about 50 yards east of the observation post, where the heaviest fire was coming from. Their arrival and subsequent fires had an immediate impact on topside by suppressing or destroying enemy forces. The enemy fire became less accurate and more remote, but they remained in their positions. UH-60 Kazovac flights began to land at about the same time as the Apache's arrival. They utilized the primary landing zone at the main COP and a secondary impromptu LZ closer to OP topside. Kazovac flights continued throughout the day through thick smoke and intense ground fire, evacuating 20 wounded and 9 KIA. First platoon had traveled as quickly as possible from Camp Blessing, covering the distance in 45 minutes, half the time it normally would take and arriving at 0600. They dropped two soldiers at the first squad traffic control point and assigned their medic to the command post. The most desperate fighting at OP topside had ended by 0630, allowing 1st platoon to mount a counter assault. One squad from 1st platoon with two vehicles advanced through the center of Wanat, catching the insurgents off guard. Taking advantage of the success from the vehicle assault, 1st platoon dispatched an element to clear the hotel and eradicate any sporadic fire coming from the town. First platoon continued to fight insurgents in and around the village, at one point engaging targets between the traffic control point and topside. The other squad from first platoon went to topside, where they were greeted with heavy but distant fire from the hilltops. RPGs continued to come in from those positions, wounding three soldiers, but the OP was no longer under the threat of direct assault. The first platoon's clearing operations pushed the insurgents out into the open where their positions were marked with colored smoke so the Apaches could engage. They fired both their cannons and Hellfire missiles into buildings in the town. As these effects took hold, they shifted fire to the compounds attacking OP topside. By 0830, four hours into the attack, the insurgents began to withdraw. Task Force Rock continued to send additional forces, dispatching a second quick reaction force from 3rd Platoon Alpha Company and a scout section. 